So in this video, I want to talk about Moonlit Fantasy Volume 3. Honestly, I think one of the things that I've mentioned in the past volumes, and I'll highlight on this again, is that the differences between the anime and the light novel aren't grand scaling. There isn't like these massive monolithic changes. Most of the keynotes are there. For example, the ogre girls that get introduced, their names, he mentions in the light novels that they sound like sports drinks. In the anime, he says the same thing. They're all the same lines. The core components of the story are all there, but there are some very interesting, subtle details that are missing. And most of it comes down to the early stages when they're talking about his power and the world that he's created, the mist world, and also the scaling to his power to the goddess. There's also some interesting back and forth between how the humans see the demi the demiplane and all that, and I feel like there's a little bit more detail and just in the disdain that the humans have and the supremacy kind of thing. And I think that was something that I was kind of like, okay, th there's some interesting details there. So the first thing I want to go over with this volume is to do with the power scaling. So when he's off practicing his bow stuff, he dematerializes and rematerializes. I can't say the, the line that he does, the way the girls perceive it, because YouTube will demonetize me. But he basically, yeah, he blends into the world, he rematerializes, and then he somehow gains power. But as he's gaining more power or more mana, the mist world grows in size. So he's constantly able to create new landscapes, or just new, like, make the area bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's quite interesting because how far can that go could he create like uh, that's the thing it, it depends on how, how you would scale it could he make a whole like how big is it already is it like the size of a country is, is it the size of a state in comparison to say like i don't know a state in Australia, or a state in America, or a country in Europe, or something like that, or is it the size of Japan? Like, what is the scale of this misland, and can it go beyond and beyond and beyond? I don't think it will get that ridiculous, because it would be too hard for the story to keep up with, but it does bring in a lot of interesting questions of how far this scaling can go, and it very much feels like it's a clear representation of Japan, which is I think a connection to his memories. I think the Miss World is kind of like his in-between connection between his past life and his current life and him having that little bit of bridge in between and being able to use that also as a way to bring things over like interesting foods and exotic stuff. So you've got that there. Then you've also got the fact that he is getting stronger and stronger and stronger with each time he does that to the point where even Toma or the dragon chick, I think it's the, yeah, I, I sometimes get their names a little bit mixed up, but dragon chick, hot dragon chick, she notes on it that he could pretty much, like, be stronger than the goddess, and the thing is, is that goddess can't make worlds, that's the thing, these, these powerful entities, gods and goddesses, they're not making worlds, they're merely just going to it and kind of interfering and mold, like, trying to mold things, it's like civilization, like a civilization or Civ Six kind of thing. Like the, the the blueprint of the world is there, but they're trying to mold couple couple of things, like give powers here, change a couple of things here. But he he can just make an entire world, and that is far more powerful because he can take an entire set of like a race, bring them to his world, and they can flourish and grow and train. Which yeah, I know someone that's already knows ahead because of season two but this is the thing they they can flourish they can grow they can train they can be undisturbed they've got this very lush rich enriched area that allows them to m have a massive advantage against some of the humans out there it's like okay he could be creating an absolute powerhouse he, he could rival the humans and the demon lord he could become his own faction when you think about it in a grand scale of things. He is his own superpower. He is a third sort of player in this game, in the sense of the humans, the demi-humans, or the demon lord, and now he's creating his own faction or own empire. It, it's The scale of it can get quite big. It feels like slime, but in a much more slower pace. I do like how it's been paced here because there's a lot of fun little back and forths, different interactions. Kind of feels like a bit of a mixture of Slime and Overlord when you think about it because with Overlord, Irons goes on a lot of adventuring stuff 
and he does his own little thing, kind of scoping out the world, learning about things and all that. And then he kind of goes back to sort of his civilization, kind of like building his, you know, Nazarick up a little bit, but not so much. It's not got so much of the civilization stuff in there. It's more of the fun adventure. But with Slime, it's a lot of adventure stuff, a lot of economics. So you kind of meld them together with him. It, it, it's an interesting combination. I'm not saying they're all identically. I'm just saying there's some interesting parallels there. I know some people get triggered whenever I do comparisons like that, but it's not a bad comparison. I think where the story is going is going to be one of those where yeah he is going to become a superpower he's going to have his own nation his own land and he's going to need a connection between the world that he is in like this new world and then his missed world there's going to be need to be a connection so he's going to need some turf there and i'm just thinking on a much more grander scale beyond season two because yeah he's going to need something because it raises questions because in this volume you've got these individual adventurers trying to get into the mist world because of all the interesting luscious stuff that's there and then they end up attacking there's going to be a layer of security that is going to need it and then there's the weather changes as well there's a lot of different things that i think he's going to need to account for and i think also he just doesn't want all those responsibilities i think he kind of just wants to go have fun and do some fun trading but at the same time he doesn't want to be king and it's like ah, little broski i i think he, i think you yeah, you yeah. You, 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 you need to realize that things are getting a little bit more far ahead than what you realize and also the relationship part this is something i talked about in the other volumes is that he does not see the two girls as a love interest he sees them as like family like sisters or something like like family so he doesn't see them romantically even though the girls see him romantically I wonder how long it will take before he realizes they see him romantically and if and when he will see them romantically because if he doesn't reciprocate those feelings that's going to hurt them like they, they you can tell that they're, they're really into him so I do feel like if he doesn't reciprocate those feelings it's going to hurt now of course I could talk about what's in this volume but at the end of the day if you've watched the anime you already know what's in the volume so I don't really see a point in going over every little dot detail like in in a different light novel review say like Alia sometimes is a feeling Russian I'll go over everything that happens in it but in this case if you've watched season one of the anime you've got everything pretty much already down packed there's it's not all of it I from what what I can tell, there is still, like, Volume 4 is got a fight scene that, I'm not going to say what, just in case, but there's a fight scene that is still in the anime that's in that volume. So, it seems to be Season 1 covers around at least Volumes 1 through 4. I won't know exactly how much of 4 has been adapted, if it's all or some, but I just wanted to note that because people like to know what's been covered, what's not been covered, whether they should read the light novel or not, and I don't want to spoil things, so I'm being very delicate there, but... It's important to highlight those components because those are the big prevalent questions like what has been skipped well n not major stuff hasn't been skipped but there's a lot of little subtle details as far as things go and also it, it highlights on some little extra minor details as well just power scaling the world the politics the economics and just how the humans i feel like how how much to stay like they show it in the anime a little bit but i feel like it's a little bit more really caked on how much the humans have this superiority complex going on and just the way he goes so coldly about removing them in the anime it's so well done the cold exterior phase the way he just doesn't care like the voice acting in it for subbed and dubbed is really well done on his part so i really like that so i feel like at the end of the day you don't have to read the light novels but i would if you really want that extra little bit of information and detail in it it's a great experience if you really want it really want that what like if you're a massive fan of moonlit fantasy yeah absolutely and the fact that they are translating them as quickly as they are is also a bonus as well so i really like the volume personally myself i've been loving and enjoying reading these and kind of what i will do is i will read it and then i'll go watch the anime and i'll try and like sort of sometimes i'll watch them kind of a little bit in sync or not in sync and i'll line them up and i'll try and work out okay what's been covered what hasn't been covered and little things like that and where does it end and that kind of stuff and i think it's done a great job I really do. And I think it's a great series for those that want an isekai that has a main protagonist that, again, isn't picture perfect. I think it's nice and refreshing that we have been getting a lot of isekais where the main male protagonist isn't just 
a default cardboard cutout self insert that's picture perfect and also it explains why he's not interested in the main love interest for the time being because as i said before he sees them as family now some people will complain oh no i'd tap them yeah oh, so would i i'd tap the spider and the dragon as well but i think it even shows that he was trying to find some love interest. He was like looking for like a, a maid type sister, which he failed at. And he was about to go to the brothel because I think he does want companionship. But because of the relationship that he has with those two girls, it's something that I also think, as I mentioned in the other volumes, he kind of finds them a little bit annoying at times as well. So he sees them as like family, but also he gets annoyed with them as well. So it's that double layer of why he doesn't really see them as a, as, as a partner on a, a love interest because of those two factors. I think as time goes on, he will somewhat develop feelings. Maybe something will happen and they'll be in danger and he'll be really upset and then he'll realize that he actually does really care about them on a romantic level and maybe he might pursue a relationship with both of them if i was him i'd be getting some spider booty and some dragon booty at the same time or individually it doesn't matter he's got the power for it he's got that manner if you know what i mean so <laughs> i love it I'd love to know your thoughts in the comment section down below what are your thoughts about volume 3 what are your thoughts about the anime I do feel like as the volumes go on, we're going to learn a lot more about the power scaling as well and the goddess and her power because it really seems like the goddess is more like a leech. She's not also powerful. There are a lot of limits to her power, but at the same time, yes, he's very powerful, but it's not a slam dunk either. And he doesn't have like absolute hatred towards the goddess in the sense like he wants to like remove her from existence. He just finds her really annoying. But I have a feeling as time goes on, things might spice up. There's also other clear gods and goddesses as well, so I look forward to seeing more of them as well. So again, if you like this video, hit the like, subscribe, and I'll see you beautiful nerds in the next video.